Good morning, church. As I was sitting there and singing this morning and listening to that prayer, thank you, Christina, I thought maybe we should just do that the whole day. Maybe we should just worship God and praise His name. But I also really want to share something with you, and I think the story we're going to look at this morning is quite, as Stephen mentioned, quite a powerful, quite an amazing story, and so I don't want us to miss out on this. I realize um, I maybe don't have as much time as I normally do, so I'll attempt to get through it quite quickly. So I'm going to ask you to hang on, listen up, hold on, and let's go on this journey together as we discover a little bit more about this kingdom of God and the stories of Daniel and his friends in Babylon. Over the last few weeks, we've entitled this whole series, The Kingdom of One, and we've tracked the story of young Daniel, this Hebrew young boy who was taken captive with his three friends to Babylon and their interactions with the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. What we noticed in all these stories is that this was more than a story about this young boy, Daniel, his friends, and the king, less of a story about them and more a story about God interacting and trying to break in into the life of this king, King Nebuchadnezzar, and break into this kingdom of Babylon and reveal himself to them so that they can get to know and understand who he is. But you see, the king was so caught up in living life for himself, in living life, trying to build his kingdom, trying to build his empire, grow this Babylon to be great, and he believed that it was by his power, by his strength, in his own might that he could do this. And so often we are like this king. So often we struggle with this thing called pride, and, and, and we try and build at our own earthly kingdoms. We try and feed into our own selfish needs, desires, and wants, and we forget about God and His kingdom. Then last week, Stephen, who took our sermon last week, shared us in Daniel chapter 4, the story where God gave this king Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And in this dream, he revealed a number of things to him. And one of what he was trying to teach him through this dream was that this way of living, this way of living for ourselves, this way of thinking that life is all about what I can get, what I can gain, how I can satisfy my own desires and pleasures, this kind of thinking actually reduces us from being human beings human beings which are spiritual beings made in God's image, it reduces us to mere animals, driven by instinct, appetites, void of spiritual godly characteristics such as love, patience, kindness, humility, faith, and peace. Now, we don't often realize that this is where this kind of life, this kind of thinking leads to, because we don't always see the immediate consequences. You see, it kind of gradually happens. It's a process that we start a path, we start walking down. But for the sake of the story and for the sake of illustrating this point, God actually brought about the consequences to King Nebuchadnezzar immediately. When he said, and he, he lifted up his eyes and he said in his heart, isn't it I who, who built this great Babylon, who made Babylon great? Immediately he became like an animal, eating the grass, living outside, unkept. People didn't come to him for advice. But as God had revealed in the dream, that after seven years, the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would look up and acknowledge and humble himself before God and declare that God is king. All this time, these seven years, Daniel, we assume, but it's most likely what happened, but Daniel was looking after the kingdom, making sure that the kingdom stayed united, the kingdom stayed intact, and the king stayed the king of Babylon, because he knew that God's promises were true, and after seven years, it happened. The king looked up, humbled himself, and he wrote these words. He said, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. Wow. Wow. What a testimony. The most powerful man in the world through this series of stories came to the point where he acknowledged, honored, and worshiped God. Isn't that amazing? 
The story continues. And what I love about these stories is it's a story about God trying to break into our lives, trying to break into our human history so that He can be known by us. And I guess the question that I want to leave with each and every one of us before we get into it is, do we pause? Have you noticed that God is trying to get your attention? In Daniel chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5, this is on page 525 in the Bible in the seat pocket in front of you, page 525, and Liz will be reading, telling our story this morning. So we'll start there, Daniel chapter 5, verse 1. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. I want us to pause right there before we get too far into the story. See, Daniel doesn't give us a lot of the history. He jumps from Daniel chapter 4 to Daniel chapter 5 just with these two words, many years later. Now, what I want us just to understand, just to get the context, I want to just fill in those many years, what, what, what had happened. You see, the Babylonian Chronicles tell us that King Nebuchadnezzar lived to the ripe old age of 104, okay? After his death, the crown moved between four different people over a period of six years, as his family members, as his sons, and all those that wanted to have the crown and, and be the kings, as they fought amongst themselves to get this crown. Finally, after six years, a man by the name of Nabonidus, who was the son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar, so one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters married Nabonidus, and he eventually came into power and became the king of Babylon. Now, he ruled in Babylon right up until Babylon eventually fell. So this begs the question. We read there in verse 1, who was the king in Babylon? In verse 1, Belshazzar. It says Belshazzar, the king. So who was Belshazzar? Another thing that I just want to share that is quite interesting. Up until not so long ago, probably up until about 80 years ago, many critics of the Bible looked at this story of Daniel, and they pointed at this name, King Belshazzar, and they said, see, look, the Bible is not historically accurate. Nowhere in archaeology, nowhere in history or any of those records do we have the name Belshazzar. Rather, the king who was reigning right up until the end of Babylon was Nabonidus. So this shows that the Bible is not true. It's just a compilation of myths or fairy tales from the Jewish nation, and it cannot be trusted. Well, about 80 or so years ago, archaeologists discovered what is now called the Nabonidus Chronicles, which were tablets, cuneiform writing on tablets, that um, chronicled the history of Nabonidus and his reign and all the facts about his reign. And it was in these chronicles that they discovered the name Belshazzar. And they discovered that Belshazzar was actually the son of Nabonidus. They also discovered that Nabonidus didn't really like living in Babylon for whatever reason. He preferred his summer castle in Tamar in Arabia. And so most of the kingdom, the, the central hub of the kingdom was Babylon, but Nabonidus would take off, for, he took off for like 10 or more years during his reign, and he went and lived in Tamar. And he told his eldest son, Belshazzar, who formerly was the leader of the army, he told him, okay, you are king, you rule in Babylon while I'm gone, you have all the rights, all the authority of king. And so here in the biblical story, Daniel gives us such accurate detail about the historical time and people that up until a few years ago, historians didn't even know that this existed. But now there's more than 27 archaeological, whether it's cylinders or tablets or scrolls, that confirm that Belshazzar was an historical figure. So this is who Belshazzar was, the son of Nabonidus. The events that we find in Daniel chapter 5 actually happened about 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. So when it says there many years later, probably about 23 years later, 
these events unfold. And one more thing of history that I want us to understand before we can move on. The historical climate at the time, the political climate at the time that this was written, what was happening was Medo-Persia, the empire of Medo-Persia, had been conquering slowly into Babylonian territory. At this time when this story was written, they had actually conquered and destroyed most of the cities formerly governed and owned by the kingdom of Babylon. There's actually a, a recorded battle just outside the gates of Babylon where, where Nabonidus and his troops were defeated and Nabonidus fled, I think once again to Tema or somewhere else, but he fled and left the city of Babylon as the Persian army camped around the city and besieged the city, everyone, all, all those still alive in the Babylonian kingdom, all the kings, all the nobles, and Belshazzar were stuck and camped in the city of Babylon. But they weren't worried. Because remember, this was Babylon the Great. This was the city whose walls, I can't remember, I, I briefly was trying to find the figures. Someone here will probably know the figures, but this city's walls were, were huge, bigger than any cities had ever been built before. This city's walls were wide, so no catapult, no machinery they had in that day and age would ever be able to get through these walls. The king at the time had seen that the Persians were approaching and they had gathered a whole lot of stores, they would gathered a whole lot of food, and the Euphrates River ran right through the city of Babylon, so they had constant food, constant water, su water supply, the enemy couldn't get in, and so the king believed that he was fine, he was safe, nothing could get to him. This city would never fall. And it's this arrogance that we find as we read about this historical figure, Nebuchadnezzar. One last point. In this verse 1, it mentions that he had 1,000 of his nobles, they had a feast, and what were they doing? says they were drinking wine. Now, wine is quite a symbolic, is often used as a, as a metaphor, as a symbol in the Bible. And like many symbols, it is used in both a positive and both a negative connotation. The positive connotation, how does the Bible speak of wine? Who, who here knows about the positive connotation? What, is, what do we say or, or, or what symbolizes what is wine a symbol of in the Bible? The blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, that, that Jesus came and died for the sins of all humanity. Wine is a symbol of that positive fact. Okay. Then there's the negative connotation. And this is the one that Stephen was referring to that is often spoken about in different parts of the Bible. But often when wine is spoken about in the negative context, it says wine... When it is abused by man, often represents false teachings, false philosophies that go against God, that go against His Word and bring confusion and deception and even destruction. And so we have these two symbols, these two metaphors of wine, and it's important to just keep that in your back of your mind as we go through the story. And so we'll carry on in verse 2. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Here the scene is set. They the feast, they drinking, they parting. Few things are out of place at this feast that I want us to, to recognize. One is that there was, it mentions a number of times that they were drinking wine. It gives the idea that there was excessive drinking which was something that nobles, something that the kings were not advised and often did not do as rulers in their kingdom. There was, there was one thing that was out of, out of place. The next was the mention of the wives and the concubines. Whenever they had a feast, whenever they had a banquet, 
as was the custom in those days, the men would have their banquet in one room and the women would have theirs in another. And so here we have this number of things that are out of place and one can only imagine what was happening in this hall as they were feasting and dining. Then the other thing that is mentioned is idols. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, he ended, he was the king in Babylon that declared, there is one God, the God in heaven, and we and all the people in my kingdom will worship him. And here we find, who's the king worshiping? He's worshiping idols, idols made by human hands, idols of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Another thing, at the heart of this feast, Daniel mentions, he says, while the king and everyone was feasting together, the king ordered that the ornaments, the vessels, the cups that were used in the temple in Judah be brought into the party, and all the king and his wives and his guests used these cups to drink their wine and worship their gods. This was no accident. This was no, it was not by chance that the king called for these vessels, these cups to be brought from the temple in Jerusalem. You see, if we remember back to chapter one and, and one of our first stories that we shared about the story of Babylon, that's the last time we heard mention of these cups that came from the temple in Jerusalem. What was often believed in those times was that if your kingdom conquered another kingdom, it meant that your God and your kingdom were stronger than the other gods and the other kingdom. And so by sacking the other kingdom's temple and taking their, their temple ornaments, you are showing that your God is stronger than their God. Was that the case with Israel and Babylon? They tried to portray that, the Babylonians, but all the while through the stories that we've been seeing, God was teaching the king of Babylon a different story, and he was telling him, no, it's because of my power that you were able to go and take the kingdom of Judah. It's because of my power that you can do anything, and so your gods are not stronger than I am. In fact, there is only one God. These, these idols that you worship aren't gods, and the king came to this realization, but here, King Belshazzar does a U-turn. He goes totally against what his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had believed and says, no, 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 I'm going to make a point. I'm going to actually, I'm going to actually position myself in direct opposition to the God of Israel, and I'll do this by bringing these temple cups, these temple vessels, and worshiping idols with them, these vessels that were once used to worship the holy God. This was no coincidence. This was no accident. And the rest of our story seems to imply this as well. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed, and his face turned pale. His nobles, too, were shaken. I can't imagine what that must have been like. Picture it. The whole banquet hall filled with this, this king, him, him sitting at the head, his his arrogant, prideful display, him mocking and, and defiling the God of heaven, then suddenly behind him, on the, in the light of the lamp, this hand comes and just writes on the wall. And the Bible tries to catch their, their expression. What, what does it say happened to the king? His knees started knocking and he sort of fell over, crumpled in a heap, gripped with fear. 
I've tried to imagine what that, what that must have been like. And, and, and the closest I can come to is an experience that I can't remember. And I was hoping to speak to my brother, Sean, to, just to get clarity on this story. But I'll have to share what I know, and Sean can correct later. But the, this happened to a friend of ours who was visiting our house in, in Fixburg. Because I was trying to think what it, what it must have been like or, or to experience that fear, that anxiety. And what happened in the story, you see, we were living in, in a time in South Africa when there was quite a lot of political unrest. And some things had actually happened in our town. Well, it had happened where a group called APLA, the African People's Liberation Army, they had actually, on a number of occasions, surrounded friends of ours, homes in our town, surrounded the houses and opened fire with automatic weapons, thrown in um, hand grenades and a bunch of other things. One of our school friends actually even died in one of these attacks. It was during the, the, the transition of government in South Africa in 1994. And why this is significant for us is because during this time as well, my, my father, who was the district surgeon, he, who would well, in charge of the area. So he, whenever there was a call out by police to draw blood for anyone that had been caught drunk and driving, whenever there was a major accident or anything like that, my dad would be the doctor that would be called out to come and deal with the situation. And one such night he was called out and there this guy had been caught drunk and the police were there wanting to deal with the situation. But the guy they had caught was the leader of this African People's Liberation Army. And no one wanted to touch him, because they knew if he made a threat on your life, you'd probably be true to it. And he was. He was threatening everyone in the room. He was saying, if you touch me, you draw my blood, I'll draw your blood. He kept saying things like that. And, and my dad, he recounts the story. He walked in there, and he, and he took one look, and he realized this was not a good situation. But he determined that he was going to draw this man's blood and bring him to justice what was the right thing to do. So he managed to find a police officer that would support him. The rest of the police officers stood back, and him and this one other police officer managed to hold the guy down and draw his blood, and lo and behold, the guy looked in my dad's face, and he said, you drew my blood, I'll draw your blood. One man, one bullet. Often we'd wake up the next few weeks, and we'd find a whole lot of police around our house, and they would tell us that they'd had a tip-off, that they, someone had phoned them and said that these guys were coming to attack our house that night. And so we had these, a plan in place. If this were to happen, we, had, we, we discussed it as a family. You know, there was one room kind of in, in the center of our house that was shielded from the outside. It didn't have many windows leading out. It was the dining room. And if ever anything like that happened, we'd hit the deck, crawl as fast as we could and get into this dining room where we'd probably be safe from any external fire or whatever may happen. Now, friends of ours came and visited during this time. And he was, this friend, he was a bit younger than, than we were, about five years younger than we were. And he just had a cast on, on his arm. He'd broken his arm. And the cast had just come off when he was there at the house. And I, just to give you a, a bit of a picture, our house was a triple-story house in this, in this small town. And the, the third floor was where us boys... That was our area. We had our rooms up there. We had a, it was quite a cool setup. And so the second floor was where my parents and the guests stayed, and then the, the bottom floor was where the lounge and kitchen and a whole lot of other stuff were. So, but at night, okay, at night when no one has been up before sunset to turn any lights on or do anything, you have to get up a stairway that is pitch black, get into this big, dark room that you, we could never find the light switch, and if you're brave enough, then wind your way through the corridor to the bedrooms and the bathroom and so on that was upstairs. And sometimes it was quite a scary thing. But anyway, this one night, we'd, we'd explain to the friends who have visited, we explained to them the routine that in case there was an attack, this is what you do, this is what happens. And the young boy, as you can imagine, he was quite on edge. He was quite he was quite nervous about all of this. And all the bathrooms downstairs were in use. And after dinner, he had to use 
a bathroom, and all the others were in use, so he decided to go up the stairs to the top floor to use the bathroom. Now, his cast had just come off, and I can't remember who it was. Who was it, Sean? Was it you? Sean had taken his cast and gone and hid in the shower. Now, once you finished in the bathroom, you had to walk past the shower to get to the hand basin to wash and clean up. And so, all the lights, everything off except for the one light probably in the, in the toilet area, Sean crept in with this, with this hand cast and he hid in the shower. And as this young guy came past, Sean just stuck the hand out the shower. <laughs> and he just, you know, crumbled into a heap with fear. And it's, it's a bad story. <laughs> The poor guy, but it just, it, you know, the, the fear and the dread that came over him, he thought, this was it, he's dead, and he let out a scream and almost a sob as he crumpled into a heap on the floor, not sure what this hand or this thing was going to do to him. And I imagine that this is what the king experienced, and the Bible says that's exactly what it was. He just, he crumbled into a heap, unable to just totally exposed his arrogance, his pride, his self-assurance, everything that he, he thought was, was valuable or he thought that he had going for him, just exposed in front of all these guests as he crumpled in fear. And I wonder, but isn't that what sin does? Isn't that so often where, how many times have we been on a heap on the floor because of some choices or, or, or because of a decision to walk down a road that we know we shouldn't have be, because we didn't listen to advice or didn't, how many times do we end up in fear, shamed, broken on the floor, but yet we still seem to walk down that road and this is exactly the situation the king found himself and no one could help him. He called all these wise men, and once again, Daniel wasn't called in. We've seen in virtually all the other stories as well, whenever the king called the wise men, called them, Daniel seemed to be missing, but it was Daniel the one who could give the answer. And here again, Daniel was missing. All the wise men looked at the writing on the wall. They couldn't explain it, and so more fear and dread gripped the whole room. But the story continues. But when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said, Belshazzar, long live the king. Don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, and wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers of Babylon. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. Young people, I want us to take note just at this point. Here we have this young king. He's doing things his way, going the direction he thinks is right. And when all else is failing him, in steps the queen mother. You see, it is good to listen to the wisdom and the experience of the queen mother and the fathers among us. Time is a wonderful teacher. Their time spent, their experience gained can be most helpful for us if we are careful to listen. Many wonder who was this queen mother. You see, it wasn't one of Belteshazzar's wives. They were there with him in the banquet, in the party. It wasn't his mother because she was with his father in Tamar. Many commentators believe this could very well have been one of King Nebuchadnezzar's wives who was still alive who still had a place of, of honor and dignity in the royal courts. And that is why she would be able to just walk in 
to Belshazzar uninvited because she was as the queen mother she held a place of honor and dignity and in her wisdom she comes out to Belshazzar and she says Belshazzar remember there was a man there was a man who was alive when your grandfather still ruled this kingdom his name was Daniel he has the spirit of the holy god in him what a powerful testimony he has he speaks with wisdom with intelligence with insight he will be able to tell you what the meaning of this is you see belteshazzar would have known daniel as i said he grew up in the royal courts he was the commander of the armies at the age of 26 when King Nebuchadnezzar had died. So no doubt, he would have sat on the councils. He would have sat in some of the meetings where Daniel and his grandfather would have been ruling and making decisions, and with all the councilmen deciding what would happen in the kingdom. Belshazzar would have known who Daniel was, and the story of Daniel and his grandfather. Who knows? Maybe Daniel even helped raise Belshazzar in the courts of Babylon. But for some reason, Belshazzar chose not to have Daniel at his party, and not to invite Daniel along with all the other wise men when he was seeking understanding and wisdom. And you see, here is what stands out to me about this point. It is not that the voice of wisdom and truth was not available to, or spoken to, Belshazzar. Rather, that he chose to ignore it. He chose to shun it, to quiet it, to drown it out with distractions, by indulging all his appetites in the hope that these would satisfy him. But how often do we do the same? How often do we choose to entertain or distract our minds instead of seeking the wisdom of God? Reluctantly, Belshazzar calls for Daniel. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, "Are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar?" I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you, and you are filled with insight, wisdom, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I'm told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult pro problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor, and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, "Keep your gifts, or give them to someone else. But I will tell you what the writing means." What I can't understand is, despite his desperate situation, Belshazzar still chooses to defy Daniel and defy the God of Daniel. And he does this by the way he addresses him. Daniel's royal Babylonian name was also. Well, similar to Belshazzar, Daniel's royal name was Belteshazzar, and Belshazzar would have known that. But how does Belshazzar address him? Aren't you Daniel the slave that my dad dragged back from Judah when he conquered your land? They tell me you've got wisdom. He still, even though he's in this desperate situation, chooses to defy, and in front of all his guests, mock and ridicule Daniel and his God. Then he goes one step further. He offers Daniel riches and fame in the kingdom. These are all things that Daniel had lived with for nearly sixty years of his life. This is after this time we see Daniel once again. As a ruler and a nobleman in the kingdom of Persia, 
Before this time, Daniel was a ruler and a nobleman in the kingdom, second only to King Nebuchadnezzar. So here, Belshazzar almost once again, still mockingly, offers him these things and tries to bribe him and say, you know, just give me a word and I'll give you these things. And here, once again, he aligns himself with the historical, the historical facts that he says, I will offer you the third place in the kingdom. Why? Who was number one? His father, Nabonidus, then Belshazzar. And he says, I'll offer you, Daniel, the third place if you can tell me what the interpretation is. So Daniel proceeds with the interpretation. Your majesty, the most high God's sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, he made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal, and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow, and he was drenched with the dew of heaven, until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself, for you have proud, proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Daniel quickly jogs Belshazzar's memory. He says, you, O king, you saw, you witnessed, you were there, you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. You experienced, you, you walked through that whole story with him. You saw how God was interacting in his life and how he declared and professed and, and praised the God of heaven. You, you knew all of that. You saw that. You even knew this God. But yet, yet you've decided to turn against God. Position yourself against God by seeking to exalt your kingdom, your power, and then you even worship gods made by your own hands, these idols. But now, Belshazzar, because of your success, because of your pride, because of your arrogance, and your choice to live only to please yourself, you have positioned yourself against God. And here's how I would like us to apply this to our lives today. These stories that we've been tracking highlight two biblical ideas. They portray two kings ruling in Babylon, two powerful men filled with pride, believing that their kingdom in this world can bring true contentment and true glory. Both of them sinned against God. Both of them did wrong things. Both of them often defied God. But there is a huge difference and an outcome in their two stories. And here for me is the difference. One king, Nebuchadnezzar, for the most part, he was ignorant. He didn't know better. He never knew about the God of heaven, whereas Belshazzar, he knew, but he was arrogant. One king, as I said, does not know God, but the other chooses to reject God. One gives credit to God when he sees God, the other sees God, but gives credit to himself. One calls the people to worship, and the other leads the people to defy God. One seeks wisdom out, and the other seeks to drown it out. One humbles himself, the other exalts himself. One is willing to admit when he is wrong, the other tries at all costs to save face. 
One chose God, the other chose self. Now I wonder, how did Belshazzar get to that point? Coming from someone who saw God's actions, coming from someone who knew the stories, who probably read the stories, who probably witnessed firsthand a lot of what happened, how did he come from seeing God to the point that we find him where he's at today? The Bible doesn't give us the full picture, but it hints at that, and we see in other Bible stories that this is often a process. This is often not just an immediate choice where someone chooses to go against God, but it is often a process. In her sermon two weeks ago, Kira mentioned this principle and this process that is at play in every one of our lives. We face choices each and every day, choices that have eternal consequences. Because of the nature of our existence, because of the way God created us, because we live in a world of sin, nothing we do or everything we do has eternal input and eternal significance. We are dynamic beings that no point along our journey, along the process, are we ever at a point where we are not either growing in one direction or another. What Kira also brought out two weeks ago is that every choice we face moves us in a direction. There is never a time when we can choose to not make a choice because that in itself is a choice. So we can never be static, never be stationary. Every decision or non-decision or rejection moves us in a direction. Often the choices made have a compounding effect over time that before we even realize it, before we even know, we are a lot further down a path than we would have maybe intended or we would have maybe chosen. It's a process. It's a path we travel. And I guess the question for each and every one of us is which direction are we going? See, Casting Crowns, they have a song that illustrates this point for me well, and it's a song, many of you might know it, it's called, It's a Slow Fade. And the, the chorus for this song, it goes like this. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white are turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made. A price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. Daniel then continued. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Many, many, tickle and parson. This is what these words mean. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tickle means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. In closing, what we notice about Belshazzar's story, that is so different from the stories we've read so far about King Nebuchadnezzar is that every time God breaks in to human history and, and reveals a bit of himself to Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar responded. King Nebuchadnezzar often ended up the chapter making a declaration or an affirmation acknowledging God. But we find no such declaration at the end of this chapter. Belshazzar makes no reference to the God of Daniel or even acknowledges that God even exists. Instead, he's silent. What I want us to understand is God does not desire that anyone go to ruin or that anyone is defeated. Yet God will not force us to acknowledge or serve him. It was this very arrogance that led Bel to Belshazzar's demise. You see, even that very night, 
Instead of being watchful and alert, the city of Babylon was deceived into thinking that they were fine, they were safe. Their kingdom was okay. Their kingdom would never come to ruin. So they were partying and sleeping while the armies of Persia diverted the Euphrates River and walked into the city under the walls, unchallenged, unopposed. Church, I know it may be a sobering question, but it's one that I've been challenged to consider while we've looked at these stories. And I believe the Holy Spirit is challenging us with these questions today. What have you placed in your life that is distracting you from discerning the voice of truth and wisdom, which is God's Word and God's Spirit? What keeps consuming your time, not allowing you to pause or reflect on God? Are there decisions that we are making or not making that are leading you down a road that is in opposition to God? Are you surrendering your will, your plans, your thoughts to the Holy Spirit each and every day? Recognizing that not choosing to is in most cases choosing not to. For those of us who grew up knowing about God, hearing the stories, seeing God alive in others, this story is for us. Belshazzar's story can very easily be our story if we allow it. People do not crumble in a day. This series for me in many ways and I believe for us as a church has been our writing on the wall. God trying to get our attention. Will we choose to surrender and to walk a life with God, following His kingdom for His glory? Or will we position ourselves against God by seeking self-glory, earthly pleasures, and earthly kingdoms? May you come to know the God of heaven, the God who pursues all of us and surrender to His Lordship and kingship in your life. May you realize that true humanity, purpose, and pleasure is found in God and in Him alone. May you fill your thoughts, your mind, your heart with His Word and His wisdom by inviting the Holy Spirit into your life each and every day. May you respond to Him as He shows more and more of Himself to you through the Bible and through the stories of fellow believers. May you honor the God who gives you breath and holds your destiny in His hands. May He be your cup, your feast, the very air that you breathe.